You are listening to Trophy Horse with your host, Tricky Mick, Alex, I yield to no one, Steve, and Sid. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show of yours. This is episode 572. I'll be hosting Kimmick alongside with me, the man, the myth, the legend. It's Alex. The man, the myth, the legend who just earned his 11th platinum trophy of the year. He brings the awesome. It's I yield to no one. Tricky's got a gambling problem. I have a gambling problem? You have a gambling problem. Why do I have a gambling problem? Well, as I said in the chat, Facebook chat, Facebook group, actually, not the chat, um, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm pretty sure every event, whether it be a proven gamer oh. event or a one set by the community, you've got a bet going on. Well, I'm trying to raise money for the kids. That hey, gambling problem is a gambling problem, no matter who it's for. Oh, don't don't even don't even go there. Oh, I went there. I I will do anything to raise money for the kids. Anything? Well, almost anything. No, that's not what you said. I'll do anything, but I won't do that. Wow, I don't get a Didn't credit for the... Were a meatloaf I was going to say, I don't get credit for a meatloaf reference there? No, no, you don't no. get credit for a meatloaf. No, you don't get credit for a meatloaf reference. All right, shut up, bitch tits. One low-hanging fruit also, too, meatloaf. Hey, shut up, bitch tits. Hey. Wow. Who are you talking to there? Yeah. Bolt- Boltius. Wow, not only did I do a meatloaf... I did a Fight Club reference and I get no love. Wow. I don't know why you think you deserve any credit for these references, sir. Anytime you guys do a reference, you get, you get on me if I don't catch the reference. That's more like unless, unless you're going to bask in the glory of Redbeard Rick with his 300-plus points this week in the trophy rarity. Spoiler. Event. Hey, man, he's got more in one week than you got all year, so. That is true. Although I did get, three, I, I did get a three-pointer today. A three-point trophy? Three point trophy. Eh. It's gonna take more than that to, to get into the top five, sir. Yeah, but the thing is though, there's a lot of there's like three other of us in the competition that all got those points at one time. So it's not like he really Wait. What'd you guys gain I mean, yesterday? He, he, he gained on some, but he didn't gain on like everybody. As long as I beat you two, I'll I'll be happy. Oh, so now we're uh, changing C C the narrative was that he would easily be in the top ten and easily be able to top Rick, topple Rick I, into the top five. The, the now two the narrative are, is changing to where he's two, not going to win the bet. All he cares about is beating us. I the two are not related at all. I just said I'll simply be happy if I beat both of you. Well, you'll probably beat me, Alex. On the other hand, I don't know. How far are you ahead Yield, of you, Alex? I'm over a thousand, so I've got oh about eight hundred points on you. Okay, that's not that's and, not that much. I will remind you that I'm keep I'm I am keeping on playing games, so it's not like it's going to be easy easy to catch up to me in the first place. But you know, do you remember last week how he said that he never loses a bet, that his name is on the line and respect for him is on the line, and he never loses yes. a bet? And now it sounds like he's already conceded. I didn't. Know. Where are you coming up with this narrative? Nothing I said in any way, shape, or form says I'm conceding the bet. You you're, you're trying all, to push trying, a narrative to that doesn't exist. I never said anything about the bet. I didn't say anything about conceding the bet. You took what I said about beating both of you and said, oh, he must be conceding the bet. The two are not related. No, it's just last week you were all like, I'm going to win this. My name is in line. And now you're like, I'll just be happy if I beat Yield or Trick, uh, Yield and Alex. Who aren't part of the bet. Right, because it if just, I get into the top 10 and you're, say I'm number 10 and you're number 8, I don't consider that a victory. That's what I said. 
All right. So you would consider it a victory even though you would lose the bet. And last week you were staunchly defensive of your... Well, I'm going to win the bet. I just got to beat okay. both of you now. Well, if you're going to win the bet, you're not going to worry about beating us because I'm not going to catch... Rick getting 300 plus points in one week, I'm not going to catch up to that man. No, but you'll be in the top 10, correct? I'm number six right now. Yeah. I've been number six. Number four, five, or six is the entire competition. Wait, I, I, okay, now you guys got me confused. Is my bet to get in the top five or the top ten? Top five. It's the top five. That's that's what I thought it was. You kept saying top ten. All right, anyway. You're the one that said you would be in the top ten last week if you unhid your trophies. Yes. That's where top ten came in. At least by at least by my calculations. I could be wrong. And also, you know what? I, I need to clarify. I don't know that that's actually true because I when I calculated the points... Oh I, my God! You are walking everything back. This I'm week. not walking anything back. I'm just being transparent. When I did the math of the trophies I had, if I unhid them, I would be in the top ten. I don't know that that's still true because I haven't checked in a couple weeks if the rarities went up or down. So I just clarified. I still believe I would be in the top ten, but I don't know that for sure. Anyway, let's get into the double uh, show. Updated trophy counts. I am level 855. Total trophies of 26,715 with 727 platinums. Alex? I will defend Rick's honor, sir. I'll have you know that. I am level 479 with a total trophy count of 8,736 with a platinum count of 145 in 144 games. Yield? Uh, level 497 with a trophy count of 9521 and a platinum count of 172. Sid is level 831, total trophies of 23,011 and 716 platinums. Still nine behind me there, Sid. Better step up your game there, killer. Ah, uh, so let's get into what we're playing. Uh, Alex, we'll start with you. What have you been playing, sir? Well... After finishing off Tales of Iron and getting done with the Horizon Forbidden West DLC, The Burning Shores, which Matt and I actually recorded a Patreon episode this past week, so if you're a Patreon subscriber, that should be available to you. I uh, started playing Roller Drum. Do either of you guys remember Roller Drum? It was one of those games that was featured as State of Play or one of Sony's presentations. I thought that was the Ubi thing. No, it is definitely not Ubisoft. Okay. No, I do not remember it. Okay, well, the game is essentially... I swear to fucking God, take that dog out. <sighs> Hold on. Jesus fucking Christ. Well, we are live on Twitch, you, uh, Alex. Hold on. <sighs> well, I was trying to make it easier to edit her out for the episode, but... It's fine. Um, but... Yeah, so Roller Drum is essentially um, best described as, and I can't take credit this, for this because I saw this online. I just feel like it's the perfect way to describe it. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, but with guns. Um, very cool art style, but essentially it's like a, a, a sports competition. You know, um, you're attempting to win the championship, and essentially every like the, you have uh, eleven different locations that you go to. There's like they're kind of like skate parks mixed into normal locations. So like you know, there's you go to two malls, but they kind of have skate park elements to them. And uh, so the goal is to you have um, enemies in each level of varying difficulties, and the, your goal is to survive and to kill all the enemies to get to the end of the match. Um, however, it's very points dependent. So you're going you have in, in like in each location you have challenges, ten challenges you need to do. And some of them include get this many points in the level. So you'll be managing, uh, you know, defeating the enemies, but also doing tricks like grinding on rails and just doing like different grabs when you're in the air to uh, kick up your points quite a bit. So uh, 11 locations, challenge 10 challenges, challenges in each location. And uh, the game is quite difficult. Um, and, I'll t and I'll tell you how the, the developers got around that because um, they probably realized that not everyone would want to deal with that. But the thing that makes the game difficult is uh, you get four weapons throughout the game and you have a limited amount of ammo. To replenish your ammo, you have to do tricks. So, uh, which, I mean, when doing the point scoring, you know, you have to do tricks in between kills anyway to get up to, you know, 1 million, 2 million, almost 3 million in one. So, you know, you got to keep a combo going and, um, 
and you got to keep doing tricks. So that the, having to reload your ammo by doing tricks does help you out quite a bit. Problem is, is that that is very, very hard when you're trying to get through the gameplay. So a big tip for anybody who's, you know, looked at this game, thought, you know, looked at the trophy list and wants to play it. They have what they call assists under the options thing. And those assists include invincibility and infinite ammo. And you can turn those on and it does not negate the trophies. You will not get onto online leaderboards, which is fine. Who cares? But you can still earn trophies. So. And how much is yeah, the game? Yeah, it's a fun game. Huh? How much is the game? It's on sale right now. I can't remember how much it normally is, but it is on sale for the time being. Fourteen ninety nine. Yeah, right now. But it's that's the sale price. Yeah, the sale price right now it, until Thursday. Yeah, and so I mean, if, when you hear this, you will you know if you listen on Wednesday, Wednesday you'll you'll have a chance to grab it. But uh, so you complete the campaign. There's also an called Out for Blood mode, which has tougher enemies and um, new challenges. I mean, new challenges. There's like. 33 new challenges, but it's all like complete the level in this amount of time. Com- uh, get this amount of, of total points. Complete one entire combo throughout the, the match. So uh, the the assists do make the game easier, but again, you still also have to manage your points. And, you know, even if you go through and just kill all the enemies in one combo, for some of the levels, like the last level of the game, you have to get 2.8 million in total. And I think I got my first way through, I got... I can't remember what it was, but it was like under 2 million and it was kind of like a slap in the face. It's like, oh, okay, now's here. We're going to have to manage these tricks. And one of the trophies is you got to get 3 million points. So I think for that, I had a combo that was over 50 enemies. And then the points total that I had accumulated from all my tricks and stuff was over 70,000. So you got to do pretty damn well still. So, um, but no fun game, love the art style, the whole Mixing the tricks with the the gunplay is a really unique mechanic that I like quite a bit. And uh, yeah, I, like I said, if you're if you're nervous about how hard the game is, you can use the assist to get the trophies. It's still fun regardless. So I would still encourage people to play it. Um, maybe try it first without the assist. But I think honestly, the assist is a fun way to play the game. So that's just me. But yeah, grab it on sale if you can. But it's still worth playing at full price. I would say. All right. Oh, that is my new platinum trophy. And yield. Uh, I've been playing some Farm Simulator 19, uh, doing some Assassin's Creed 4 multiplayer boost, some Deep Rock Galactic, World of Warship Legends, uh, Kina, Bridge of Spirits, and the first tree. Mm. That's it for this week. Yeah, speaking of the first tree, you had chipped on a point, but we're not going to go into that. No, he messaged back and said, I, I get two. I. For- for pre twenty three, I told you that. Well, like I said, I, I look out I for had, my boys. I, I I had had a talk, and it was like, okay, whatever, I'm cool. Yeah, but I I talked to him. Or no, I didn't talk to him. But yep, you, I, you I look, look out, out for, for people, except when they get po- they they're supposed to get points for shovel night DLC, and you're like, no, no, no. He because like you were, you know what? We're not going down this path. I'm staying happy this episode. I'm celebrating today. I'm not going to let you guys put me in a bad mood. I'm in a what good do you mean, mood. you guys? I haven't done anything yet to attack you. Oh, really? Punching me in Assassin's Creed boosting? We always do that. No, we started off the session by, we're not doing that. The first thing you does, punch me in the face. Well, you had already got your kill, so it doesn't mess anything up. It does. So much. You know, I'm in a happy mood. I'm staying in a happy mood. Yeah, but we 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 did behave though compared to what we normally have. Yes, we did. Well, we, don't put we in there because I don't misbehave. I go in there for a purpose, and you guys just like, oh, you know what? I'm not uh, fuck tricky. I'm not gonna let me kill. I'm gonna punch him. <laughs> well, we weren't necessarily. Well, what did you do to deserve it? it? Nothing. You I do nothing to deserve it. No, because when when you no, because we get we get bored. Because all, all we're doing is, okay, it's your guys' turn to get the kills. So we run up, and and you get killed, you know, and then the next game you flip-flop. Well, that gets boring after a while. So if somebody has already got the kill, we walk up and we'll slap that guy so that way we at least get a few points before the other guy kills us. And then shenanigans starts ensuing from that. Yes. Uh, all right, and I've been playing, did a little Division 2, uh, and been playing Grid Legends a lot. I saw you playing that. So how is that? 
it's not a bad racing game. Yeah. And the next thing I'm going to say is I, I know it's going to draw some, you know, shenanigans, but I'm finding it way too easy. Okay. And the fact that every race I'm beating second place by at least 30 seconds. Oh, wow. Are you, you mean, is there a difficulty? or there is this? A, It's difficulty, and I have it up to, I think it's the second hardest difficulty. Um, but, I, and I'm not saying, like, I'm, like, superior at the game. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm just saying, I, I uh, okay. You'll remember back in the day there was a NASCAR game that you, if you hit somebody enough time, they became your rival, and they, like, went out to hit you? Yeah. Okay. That, it was one of the heats, I think, or something. But no, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Okay. So, in this game, if you hit somebody enough, they become your rival. Okay, fair enough. But in the very next race, they're perfectly fine with you again. Oh, so they don't hold a grudge. Right. And the fact that I'm making them a rival means nothing. If I'm 30 seconds ahead of you, you you have no opportunity to retaliate. So, like, it, the rival system to me is, like, pointless. Because not only does it not carry over, but it also doesn't matter if I'm so far ahead of you. I um, gotcha. Um, I'm, I'm going through... And, like, I'm knocking out the trophies, but I'm not exactly sure, like, if I'm doing progress towards the platinum or not. Because I've done the story mode. That's completed. I'm doing the career, but it seems like the career, it's weird because you have to do certain things. Like, you have to drive a car a certain number of miles before you're allowed to upgrade this particular weapon or part of your car, like the the engine or the tires or whatever the case may be. And in the races that they're giving you, you don't have enough mileage to get up there. One, one barrier is 10 miles. The next one I think is 35 miles and the next one's 50 miles. I've done all the races in the open car, but I'm only at 18 miles. So that means I would have to redo the races I've done already like three times, three more times, just to unlock the next level. And then I would have to do it at least another six times to unlock the third level. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's 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 a lot of redundancy. Uh you got you know, you got the open cars. And then I did a race with an open wheel car and I I, I don't understand this. Maybe I'm just you know, because most of the time I was I was I started playing it when I was recording the Loop Brothers, so my TV was on mute, so maybe I missed some, like, story beats or whatnot. But I'm driving an open car, and then I start the race, and then it tells me I'm in a queue. I'm 32nd in the queue, and the cars are running. You know, I'm, I'm watching the race go on, but I'm 32nd in the queue. Then it hits, then it comes on me. It starts being in last place, and the guy has a minute and a half lead on me. And then I get up to the front half of the cars, and instead of being in an open car, they're all in semi trucks. And I had five laps to catch them, and I caught them, but it does it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you put me in a queue thirty second? Like, there's nobody else in there. There's not. It's not like an online lobby. Like, it's lear- learning or waiting for space in the queue in the on the server. And then when you start me. I'm on the second lap, and I'm a minute and a half behind the leader. It almost sounds like it's one of those races where you intentionally start behind, and then you have to catch up to the leader. Right, but it, it's actually running the race for my car while I'm in a queue that makes no sense. Oh, it's, well, it's starting yeah. me on lap two, a minute and a half behind the leader. And I only have, well... At that point, three and a half laps to catch him. So, like, it, it doesn't... I, maybe I missed something. I don't know. But, like, I'm working my way through the, the sponsorships. Uh, you got, like, weird things you got to do for the sponsorships. Like, I had to do uh, 300 seconds of near drafting. In which I basically had to get behind somebody. I just, like, pushed them for 300 seconds. And then the ironic thing is, I, I you know, I, I did that... You know, a lot of races until I got to the last lap. And then the last lap, I just took off. But I did that. I pushed somebody for four laps. 
And then the second I passed them, they became my rival. I didn't even touch them. I was thinking, like, I, I pushed you to, like, a, a, a minute lead. Like, whoa. Now, now I pass you? Oh, no. Fuck you. Now you're my rival because you passed me after I helped you for four laps? I don't, it's, it's weird. I don't know. Uh, the story takes about three hours to go through. The career, I think, is going to take me a lot longer. But some places I read, you can get the platinum in 20 hours. Some places I read, you can get the platinum in an hour, 100 hours. So I don't know. Uh, and then I played Assassin's Creed with Yield today. So that's all I've been playing. All right. So we are going to go into our topics here. Our first topic is coming from IGN. Surprise, surprise. And written by Cat Bailey. Take Two has canceled several unannounced games and quietly delayed others amid the publisher's uh, calls a, quote, challenging consumer backdrop, end quote. Take Two made the announcement during today's earnings report, saying that the, quote, development of timelines of some of our titles have lengthened, especially as we strive to redefine the creative standards of excellence in our industry, which affects our release slate for the year, end quote. Take Two will incur a $54.2 million impairment charge in the fourth quarter related to capitalization software development costs and unreleased canceled console and PC titles. In May of 21, Take-Two said it aimed to release 60, some 62 games by 2024 across a variety of formats and platforms. Delays and cancellations have been frequent in the game industry, impacting big-budget games like Starfield and Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. <coughs> Speaking with IGN, Take Two CEO Strauss Zelnick attributed delays to consumer demand for excellence, among other factors. End quote. The best possible way to look at look at it is that we're all seeking quality, and consumers are demanding quality, and sometimes that could take longer than expected. And another way to look at it is that we're having some pro- productivity challenges. I think people here would say it's not all about productivity; it's about seeking excellence. I think the truth is somewhere in somewhere in the middle. End quote. When he was asked to clarify productivity challenges, Zelnick pointed to the company's hybrid work policy, which encourages workers to be in the office three times per week, but many, but many work remotely. Quote, my personal view is that we probably do our best work when we're together in person, uh, Zelnick said. In terms of changing the policy, Zelnick said he would, quote, listen to and trust his colleagues, end quote, but many senior members of the company share his view. So... Uh, I go into all that to, you know, to really talk. We're now in a society, especially now with the pandemic, where a lot of people were working in the office. And then when the pandemic hit, we uh, a lot of people went to remote work. Some had that option. Some didn't have that option. Uh, my question to you, gentlemen, is if, I don't know this for a fact, but I would assume that video game development can be done remotely for the most part. So, should developers be at a point where saying, okay, do your best work, but I think it should be in the office, or are you okay with developers working remotely where, you know, something goes wrong, they can't exactly just walk over to somebody else's desk and say, hey, this is wrong, you know, help me fix this or whatnot. I I, I don't know if my question is coming out properly. Uh, Yield, I'll go to you first. I, yeah, I don't quite know if I get your... Okay, well, what I'm saying is with the pandemic, a lot of developers started working remotely. Like, uh, Yeah. So now yeah. that the pandemic is essentially over, and I'm using quotation marks here, should developers be forcing their employees to come back to the office, or are you okay with them working remotely even if it causes delays in the games coming out? I mean, honestly, and, and this is going to take a lot of, I, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but a lot more analyzing to really figure out if it hurts games or not. I mean, honestly, as long as you make a good game, I don't really care if you work remotely or if you work in the office, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All right, Alex. I guess it's up to the team and, you know, the studio and what they think is best. I, I, you know, I get that working everyone in person probably will make the project go more smoothly. I mean, there's some people like 
I imagine Patrick, when we had Patrick on for the Russell Quest interview we did with him and just, you know, talking to him in general, I imagine he, what he does is remote. Like he can do stuff remotely and just kind of send it to whoever he needs to send it. The voice work that he does. But some cases there may be something where the studio, y'all need to be there. Like everyone needs to be there and interacting in person instead of on a Zoom call or Skype or whatever. I can see the benefit of everyone. I mean, people, a lot of people will probably want to work from home. That is a benefit to the, uh, and benefit to the the worker, the employees, but also probably helps with their attention. I mean, people are probably, a lot of people are probably drawn to a job that is, you know, work at home. And also you have, you know, if you have a, a building that you have to rent or own to do work in, if you're, you know, you can get by by being remote, you necessarily can save costs by not having to, you know, have that, that, that building space, that office space. But then just the team all there together in some kind of together space like I, I just feel like that would help everyone work better together and come with a a better product now whether that's feasible never having worked on a game or not i don't know but i that, that is what i the way that i read it um it's good that i think that take two does a hybrid schedule where it's like you know hey you guys can work from home but some of the days of the week you got to come into the office so i mean with crunch being a thing still in the games industry i can imagine that Working from home is not something that everybody can do. I'm sure that still a lot of people have to go back into the office, but it's a case by case basis. I personally, I think that everyone should be in the. I I, I like Take Two style, giving some people the option where they want to work, or at least for part of the week, say, hey, you know, we understand coming into an office and dealing with traffic and all that's kind of crappy. So you know, work from home for these couple of days, but we need you in here these days. I think that would help employees, at least you know, with their uh, mental health and their well-being and all that. You know, some people just don't like to go into work all the time. So I can see how that would benefit both the company and the the employees. But I think that you got to, that hybrid style, you got to have some days when everyone's all in the same place to kind of talk through problems and, you know, smooth out any issues that exist. Matt G from the chat says, blaming delays on work from home is a scapegoat. Games were long de- uh, delayed long before work from home, work from home became a thing. I agree. But I, I I think somewhat to like what Alex was saying is like if everybody's in the same space, I think work goes smoother and you're able to address issues quicker than having to send an email or get somebody on the phone or what the case may be. Being able to get up and go to somebody else's desk and say, hey, I'm having an issue with this pixel. Can you come over here and help me? That, I think, it helps the efficiency of getting games done. I think if everybody's working from home, I think that not only, you know, I, I'm not trying to use a scapegoat, but I think that adds to potential delays of a game saying, well, we weren't able to hit this deadline because I couldn't get Joe on the phone or I couldn't, you know, Joe didn't answer his email or Joe's internet at home went out, you know, whatever the case may be. I Joe think Joe must have at and <laughs> It's possible. Um, but I, I just think that if everybody's in the same space working together, work is more efficient than it is, you know, trying to, you know, make sure everybody's on the same schedule. You know, I, I don't know. That's just my personal feelings. Uh, Alex, you also mentioned, I didn't put it in the agenda, but you wrestle, mentioned WrestleQuest. Uh, we do have some sad news. It has been delayed. Um, previously, it was supposed to be out this month. Obviously, they're not going to hit that date, and they came out uh, about a week ago and then, uh, announced that it's going to be delayed until the summer. Still no firm release date, but WrestleQuest has been delayed to the summer. So, it's well, uh, it'll it'll give us something to play during the summer when um, there's typically a a yeah, it's a barren, not a barren wasteland, but it's it's much drier in the summer for not only in the in the air but also when it comes to the game releases. And you know, it probably was Patrick did such a good job on the game. They're like, you know what, we want you to do some extra work for us, Patrick. So we're gonna need you to work. Hard. I'm not blaming the delay on Patrick. I'm just saying that Patrick's such a good worker. They probably want more of Patrick in the game. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, gentlemen, I both put a uh, message in the Skype chat. If you could just go to the agenda and give me your answer. Um, as we move on to our next uh, topic here, also coming from IGN, Ubisoft is looking to Assassin's Creed for future salvation amid a challenging year. This is coming from IGN and written by Rebecca Valentine. 
Following a challenging year of losses and few releases, Ubisoft is preparing to pump resources into the Assassin's Creed franchise to secure its future. This will include a restructure that will allow increased headcount on Assassin's Creed title development by 40% in the coming years, following a rash of layoffs that reduce the company's global headcount below 20,000. In its full year earnings today, Ubisoft reported that in fiscal year in which its only major releases were Mario... Uh, plus Rabbits, Sparks of Hope, Just Dance 23, and Rocksmith Plus. Its net sales were uh, down $1.97 billion, 14.6% from last year, and overreported an operating loss of $543 million. While Ubisoft previously stated that Sparks of Hope and Just Dance uh, underperformed, I hate when the ad comes up and throws off my thing, other live services kept uh, money flowing in, with the Assassin's Creed franchise in particular ways reaching a new record active users despite no new game release. Ubisoft uh, reports that all, not only does Assassin's Creed Valhalla now have 44% more players life to date than Origins and 19% more than Odyssey, it's bringing in more money per player than either game. This likely explains why Ubisoft is gearing up to go hard on the Assassin's Creed franchise in the upcoming years. Assassin's Creed Mirage is still set for release this year, and three other major games are on the horizon alongside additional VR games and a mobile game in the franchise. Ubisoft has stated it intends to increase the number of people working on the franchise across the company by 40% in the coming years to, quote, fuel its ambitious ex expansion, end quote. Though it seems uh, likely much of this will come from promised targeted restructurings as an ongoing cost cutting measures have dropped the company's global headcount from tw below 20,000 from a September total of 20,700. Ubisoft told investors that it plans to uh, continue, quote, tight control of recruitments and non-core assets, meaning we're likely to see Ubisoft continue to reduce the overall number of games it takes on at once, a process that had already begun in earnest, and spend more time, money, and person power on Assassin's Creed. Now it goes on to say, but um, uh, it uh, the the article goes on to, to say more, but it basically repeats everything. But it says um, this quarter's announcements did come along any game delays or cancellations. Ubisoft's coming financial year, including the end of March twenty four, still promises to include not just Mirage, but Avatar: Front Frontiers of Pandora, Tom Clancy's The Division Resurgence, which is a mobile game. Rainbow Six Mobile, which is another mobile game, Crew Fest Motor, the Crew Motor Fest, and Skull and Bones, which has also been delayed six times now, and X Defiant, and another quote large game end quote that has not been named. And Ubisoft expects to say more about these games in the Ubisoft Forward coming on June twelfth. Alex, we'll go to you first. Here, go to Yield real quick. I gotta let. There's a cat scratch on the door. I gotta let him out. All right, Yield. Ah. Uh. I disagree with them wanting to put all their eggs in the Assassin's Creed basket, but that's Ubisoft. I that, mean, and that just, is their big moneymaker. Yeah, but we're just a few years away from them restructuring how they wanted to do the Assassin's Creed games because people were tired of them pumping a game out every year. And then now here we are, what, five, eight years later, and... You know, Assassin Creed Ho. So, I, I just disagree with that. Yeah, I do agree with. Don't take on too many projects. I I think that's the case with any game developer, no matter your no matter your size. You don't take on more than you can chew. Um. Yeah. That that's what killed Telltale, right? They took what, on too many well, projects. I think Telltale too many, really died too many because licensing projects. Well, I, I think that's some of it, yes. And and I think Telltale also, uh, the, the nail in their coffin was basically like they were pumping out so many games so quick that they never upgraded their engine, which was causing problems within the games themselves. People were getting frustrated that the, the game engine never really seemed to improve either. It could be that. Yeah, but also, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, that could also tie back into you pay so much licensing fees for all these things like Batman and the walking dead and all these other projects they were doing. And you don't have money to upgrade your engines because you're just making on these games that yeah, on the surface may sell decently enough when they come out, but then you take on more and more, you're, you're paying more and more in fees. And then you have, you know, 
again, do you have enough upgrade your equipment? Yeah. Do you have the funds to take care of what you need to at home, like for the housekeeping section of that? All right. Moving on to our next topic here. Um, Also coming from IGN. Spoiler, everything's coming from IGN this week. Uh, Written by Ryan Leston. Fans who noticed Hogwarts Legacy had an unusual lack of repercussions for murdering and using other unforgivable curses will be pleased to hear that the developer, Avalanche Software, had also thought about a lot about it. As reported by PC Gamer, a new data main... Data Mine of the popular Harry game, Harry Potter game has revealed uh, that a morality system was at least tested before launch, meaning that using unforgivable curses wasn't so quite free and easy. An U- a YouTuber, Grant Th- Th- Theft Diamonds, uncovered a hidden morality system while looking through the game's SQL files, and it would have been given a house point penalty to wizards who chose to use... I'm not trying to pronounce that spell... Uh, and other unforgivable curses. Did you say Avada? Was it Avada Kedavra? Yeah, yeah, that one. The dead, the death spell. Okay, that's what it was. I think that's what it was. But I just didn't want to try to pronounce it and butcher it. Uh, as you might expect, the killing curse would have racked up the worst penalties, removing a hundred house points from players. Casting Imperius would cost the player fifty points, while in-game actions such as extortion or bullying would have cost fifty and twenty-five points, respectively. Only a few actions uh, awarded an increase, like studying in class, it's add in 10, or participating in a club, which added 5. It's not just a house point deduction, either. Other consequences, I hate when an ad comes up, for your misdeeds include references to crime scene investigations. Suppose this, uh, uh, ultimately, however, the morality system was scrapped. Quote, it was important for us to give players who sought out to be a dark witch or wizard an opportunity to do so, end quote, said the lead designer, Kelly Murphy. Uh, they told Games Radar earlier this year, quote, this is the ultimate embodiment of role playing, allowing the player to be evil. Additionally, this was important because it comes from a place of non judgment by the game creators. If you want to be evil, be evil. So, uh, my question to you, gentlemen, is we've played, we've all played a game where there was a morality system, uh, kind of like Infamous, that comes to mind. Uh, I don't know, did any of us play Harry Potter? No. Ashley did. I watched some of Ash- some bit of Ashley playing it, but I, I've not um, played it at all. I know Dupes played it. But, Dupes, uh, Dupes well, got I mean, the platinum. A number of us played it. I think JT also played it. There were Trost played some as well. So well, I think I, there were a number of people in the community that did. Well, I know the community played. I was just wondering if any of us played it, the three of us. No, uh, we didn't. Um, I, I put this in there because, uh, you know, I always try to look for the, the question outside of the article, but how do you guys feel about morality systems in games? Like, should there be penalties for doing bad actions or should you get rewarded for being a good guy? Yield, I'll throw it to you first. Well, I mean, ultimately, it depends on your game. You know, I mean, are you are, are you leaving up? Are you leaving those choices up to the player, or you know, it's are you playing as a bad guy, or you know, does the story dictate that you're a bad guy? Does the story dictate that you're a good guy? Um, I don't care one way or another about a morality system as long as it fits in the game and used correctly. Which I know is kind of a broad thing, but that's what I want if you put a morality system in your game. You know, don't put a morality system in your game, and I'm supposed to play as a bad guy. Well, that, yeah. That's kind of uh, contradicting. All right. You know? Alex? I mean, sometimes morality systems make more sense in uh, some games more than others. I mean, uh, some kind of karma system, I can see how it would work well. I think the question is, in, in a lot of games, it's like, yeah, you have a morality system, but does it really make a big difference? Does it really matter? I mean, I'm, I'm not dogging on the idea completely, but I think that, you know, with with Infamous, I mean, yeah, when you did negative actions and or you did positive actions, basically you had a, a tree of, uh, a skill tree or like a, a tree of attacks you know, if you went, if you were good, you can only, you know, do certain attacks. If you were bad, you can only do certain attacks. So, I mean, 
you know, there are some cases where dishonored, the more you um, chaos you caused by, you know, being more open and out with your your killing, more rats would come to the city of Dun Dunwall. So their games handle it differently, but I don't know. I can't really think of a game that handled it super super well. I mean, I think Infamous choices. did it well, huh? I think Infamous did it well because depending on Again, what you were doing, but it comes down to what act, what like you have access to different powers, like. What? And and we all played the game. If you had the platinum trophy, you likely played the first playthrough on good, and then the second playthrough, which was the hard one, you yeah. played as bad because you didn't have to care about your actions. You didn't what? have to kill it, care about hurting civilians or anything. You just could blow everything up, and that made the game easier. Yeah, I don't but know. In, in but also like in infamous. I mean, not that it was really like a hindrance, but the crowd reacted differently. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, but again, like we're not talking about major major differences that affect the gameplay, right? I mean, you again. You can they can show things happening around the city, like a like a mob of people booing you or something like that, or you know the city is dirtier, like in Dunwall with the rats. I just don't think that there's ever been a a massive like a game that really really did morality so well that I thought it was completely necessary. I mean, I don't know. It, given some more time to think, maybe I could come up with something. But I mean, Infamous had a good system, but. Would it have been fun without it? Yeah, you could have made Infamous without it. I mean, so I guess there is something to be said about having that duality of the good and the bad and be able to play as both, but I just think that a, a karma system can be good. You just got to make sure that you implement it and it's deep enough and it makes sense and it, it actually matters. It's not superficial, and I feel like for most games, those kind of things are superficial. Um, like Aloy's choices in Forbidden West or Horizon Zero Dawn, really that what that really affects in most cases in the first game is you got a trophy for answering all with the heart. So, I mean, really, you're answering three different options, the heart, the fist, the brain, you know, what what is leading you. But at the end of the day, aside from maybe the Burning Shores DLC, those decisions really aren't that impactful. I mean, would you agree with that, Triggy? I, well... Yes and no, because uh, I, I listened to the Patreon episode that you guys uh, did, uh, you and Matt G did. Uh, thank you both for doing that, because as, as, as I was unable to get to it myself. Uh, but you guys mentioned something on the show that I didn't experience in my game. Um, and without spoiling anything, um, the decision you guys made at the end made, a converse, made the conversation you guys had different from the conversation I had. And I don't know if there's more choices like that in either Horizon game, depending on the choices you made. So, it's hard to say where the morality system comes down to, because my my best example for a morality system, which is no morality system at all, is like the Division. If I go into the Dark Zone, I can run around and kill NPCs and, you know basically get all the dark uh, dark zone exclusive loot. But at any time, I could hit a button and turn rogue. And then, to me, it's just you know, going rogue is you, you're just being a dick because you're trying to you know, ruin other people's uh, games. You're trying to take their loot, all that stuff, which there's a benefit because you can get their loot, but you never know what kind of loot they have. But once I die or once my manhunt timer expires, I go back to being a good guy and now you can't be addicted or I can't be addicted to you anymore unless I decide to go rogue again. So I I don't know like I like a good morality system where the choices you make are different. Um the best thing I can equate to a morality system in today's games is like the telltale games because depending on what decision you make affects the gameplay. Those are the type of morality systems I like. Uh, Matt G says he loves a morality system and most gamers don't, most games don't penalize you one way or the other. Um, which I think yeah. is a, I think is a problem because if you have a morality system, you need to be penalized or rewarded. I mean, would you guys agree? Well, yeah, make it meaningful if you're going to put it in there. I mean, it's not really, it's not like it's a, a, a game breaker or a deal breaker. Like you can still have fun with a game that has a morality system that kind of doesn't really punish or penalize you. I mean, you think of GTA, I mean, that may be one example of a morality system that kind of, I mean, really, when you're playing GTA, you're playing it because you, you want to run around and wreak havoc. You're not trying to be nice. 
a game, but they do have the star system where you are quickly overwhelmed if you're out there being too much of an asshole. So if you want to take on the cops and you want to take on the tanks with a rocket launcher or whatever, you're in the end going to pay for it. All right, Alex, like, Alex, let me pause you for one second because uh, Tross just came into the chat because I asked him to come into Twitch. Uh, Tross, uh, you played the Harry Potter game and we were talking about the morality system that was taken out. Uh, just in your in the chat, tell us, would you have liked the morality system to be penalized for using the unforgivable curses and spells and stuff like that in the game, or were you fine with the way the game was? Uh, I'm sorry, Alex, go ahead. No, but I mean, the, the example of GTA, when you, yeah, you can get away with doing, like, terrible things in that game, but the more and more you do, it'll kick up your ranking and or your rating as far as the stars and law enforcement goes, and eventually they will hunt you down and they will overtake you. Um, infamous you can be a nasty asshole and use all your evil powers and nothing like that ever happens like you're never overwhelmed by anything you just I mean there are things in the world that show you that you are a bad person but you know it's not like you're overtaken by law enforcement when you do deal with that or when you're just throwing like energy bombs out into a crowd of people so as infamous you know, one of those games that I feel like was more pioneering when it comes to this kind of thing. I also think that they didn't. It was. It was. It was a little more superficial because it really was tied to what powers you could use and the look, what Cole looked like. Was Cole like, you know, look more like himself and kind of like that blue aura, or was he, you know, darker and have that red aura around him? So, you know, some games doing it better than others. It's never really a hindrance, but also at the same time, if you're going to put something like that into the game, if you're going to make it a point, especially nowadays with what we expect from our video games, I would like it if you made it more meaningful. All right. Uh, while we're waiting for Trust to answer that question, Trust did pop in before I asked the question saying, he likes the morality system in Infamous where you gain different powers based on if you're good or bad. Um, so I'm just going to stall a little bit here to give Trust enough time to answer about Harry Potter. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, it... I, I think if you're going to have a morality system, there needs to be consequences or rewards. Like, it has to, like, in Alice's words, it has to mean something. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of the morality system? So what if, like, an infamous, the crowd decides to, you know, revolt against you and say bad things as you're walking around? Um, it, unless there's, like, a hindrance, like, I, I don't know. Because, well, it, because I, I can, I'm, we're not dogging on Infamous because we both No, like no, no. I love Infamous. I, th I think that, you know, for the PS3 days, like, you know, in the early days of a morality system or, you know, I, I I never played Fable, but I think Fable also has something like that. Um, not, I'm not necessarily, like, saying like Infamous, but I think Fable also, you know, traditionally has dealt with some kind of morality system to it. But I think in the early days, what they did for a morality system was, was fine. Like, we enjoyed the games, we had fun with it, and everything seemed fine. So... You know, no, looking back, that those games are much older now, and you know, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. But I, I think that what we're saying is going from here in twenty twenty three, what we expect from our games is is far more than what we expected from like a game like Infamous. Yeah, I like I was I was going to say like Gotham Knights. You know, there's no morality system in Gotham Knights, but you're going around as one of the you know four sidekicks, and for some reason that's unexplained in the game. The cops all hate you. Like, there's good cops, there's bad cops, but even the good cops are hated and they're charged with taking you down. But it's never explained because you figure if the cops were all good with Batman, why wouldn't they be good with the sidekicks? Like, that, well, the, the cops well, actively you, track you down and try to kill you. If you, if, you're if vigilantes hate. and the cops weren't all good with Batman. You realize that, right? No. I mean, Batman had a good relationship with Commissioner Gordon, but the cops weren't all good with Batman. Yeah, I mean, Commissioner Gordon in this game, uh, spoiler, is dead. So, um, both Batman and uh, Commissioner Gordon are dead. But it, it's never explained, like, why the cops just, like, did a 180. All right, so going back to the chat, Tra says, Yeah, I think there needed to be a morality system in Harry Potter. It would have added more to the game. Especially, I wish Hogwarts Legacy was more like Mass Effect, where the choices you make affect dialogue, spells, relationships, etc., if they had that, it would have made Hogwarts way better and made the game more meaningful. And then Matchy says, ramifications could be as simple as the way people treat or react to you. Matt, I agree with you, but there's also, I think there needs to be more to it. Because just the way they treat you or react to you, I mean, unless it's a, a cutscene or like an impactful character, 
it, that doesn't matter because if it's just a random NPC on the street saying, oh, go to hell or go fuck yourself or whatever like that, to me, that's not enough. Uh, Tross also comes back and says exactly something like that just to give more depth to the game besides uh, go here, talk to this person, cast the spells, and repeat. Yeah, that's the that way I feel. All right. We're going to move on here to our next topic. Uh, Mortal Kombat 12 has been revealed, and it's not called Mortal Kombat 12. It's called Mortal Kombat 1. Uh, coming from IGN, written by Ryan Dinsdale. Warner Brothers Games uh, and other episodes have officially revealed a rebooted Mortal Kombat 1 will arrive September 19th for the uh, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series, Nintendo Switch, and PC. Uh, the game will introduce a reborn Mortal Kombat universe that has been created by the fire god Liu Kang, featuring reimagined versions of uh, iconic characters as they've never been seen before, along with a new fighting system, game modes, bone-crushing finishing moves, and more. These characters so, uh, so far include Liu Kang, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Raiden, Kong Lao, Katana, Melina, Shang Tsung, and Johnny Cage... NetherRealm has confirmed these characters to feature to be featured in a new story mode, but is yet to reveal which other game modes will be featured in Mortal Kombat 1. There is a $110 premium edition, which will give players early access beginning on September 14th, alongside 1,250 Dragon Crystals, the in-game currency, a Johnny Cage skin styled after John claude Van Damme, early access to six new playable characters, and five new cameo fighters. These cameo fighters are a new roster of characters that assist the player in during matches and are chosen from a unique roster separate from the main Mortal Kombat 1 characters. There is also a $250 collector's edition um, that is just for the 5 and this Xbox series, which includes all premium edition content plus a 16.5-inch Liu Kang sculpture, three exclusive art prints and steel case, and 1,450 additional dragon crystals. Uh, there will be a beta for the game. Uh, and yeah. Uh, and there's another part to this is, uh, this is the part that always annoys me when I have to report stuff like this. Mortal Kombat 1 DLC characters have seemingly been leaked by the Amazon listing. A roster of playable characters and cameo characters for Mortal Kombat 1's first DLC combat pack has seemingly been leaked online. According to a project listed on Amazon Italy, there are six playable characters and five cameo characters included in the combat pack. The six players are said to be Quan Chi, Omni Man, Ermac, Peacemaker, Takata, and Homelander. Do any of those names uh, outside of does Peacemaker or Homelander sound familiar to you guys? Yeah, Homelander is from the boys on Amazon. Yep, I've never I've never actually seen it, but I, I recognize that name. And Peacemaker is uh, John Cena's character in suicide squad correct and they they did the a, a standalone project for him as well so yep. uh and the cameo characters in the leak are tremor johnny cage chameleon mavile and Farah. johnny cage is now a cameo character i don't know how people are gonna like that but i mean you know mortal kombat one you would think that everyone from the first mortal kombat would be a character in it but kung lao is from the second game so obviously they're gonna include people who are not you know outside the first game because yeah. well you couldn't just you know come out with mortal kombat one and have it be like the original characters like that the roster would be way too small people would expect more from a, a new age mortal kombat game especially as you know every fighting game it's like bigger bigger roster you gotta have a bigger roster that's one of the kind of the checkpoints you gotta hit so melina was surprised. also melina was also from the second game as well yes uh, and katana i thought katana was in the first one nope Let's see, was the first you're right. one? You're right. You're right. It you're was, right. right. was right. Liu Kang, Kano, Sub Zero, Scorpion, Sonya Blade, uh, Johnny Cage, and Raiden. And Raiden, yeah. yeah. You're right. And of course, you know Shang Tsung, Reptile, and Goro. Um, yeah, but they weren't playable characters. I think Reptile was. No, I think. I or think... no, no, no. You fought Reptile at the bottom of the pit. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean. The whole, I, they kind of threw me for a loop on this because they're kind of resetting the timeline and kind of rebooting everything to some degree. And I just assumed, I think a lot of people just assumed that Mortal Kombat 12 would be them just having another game, continuing well, what they were doing, and just well, having a big roster of characters with a focus on the 3D era characters who hadn't been seen in a long time. All right, well, 
I, I want to correct you there because I know you guys didn't play Mortal Kombat 11. Um, but at the end of the story mode, um, the main boss of Mortal Kombat 11 was... I can't think of her name. Anyway, she had the ability to rewind time and change destinies. At the end of Mortal Kombat 11, depending on the character you, you beat it with, you know, they changed time or did whatever they did, uh, you know, in comparison to their character. I guess they're going the, the Liu Kang route in which he decided to restart the whole situation. Now he's a fire god uh, instead of uh, Raiden. Like, uh, Liu Kang's a god, but Raiden, uh, Raiden's not. So I guess they're going with that storyline, and that's where they're basing this from, saying we're continuing the story from Mortal Kombat 11, but just then Liu Kang's image, not any other characters. So, All right. Uh, hey. Yield, Yield, I know you're quiet because you don't play fighting games. You're right. <laughs> that's why I'm not even going to ask your opinion about it. All right. Uh, let's get into our next topic because uh, we're going to skip uh, the one I put in there. Uh, maybe we'll address it later in the future. Uh, big news from Sony this week. They are coming out with a PlayStation Showcase. Um, if you listen to this show, uh, hopefully you listen to it early. Uh, the PlayStation Showcase is Wednesday, um, depending on your time, uh, 1 p.m. on the West Coast, 3 p.m. on the East Coast, and 9 p.m. in the UK. Uh, so hopefully you listen to it early so you can be able to watch it. Uh, it's going to run for a bit over an hour on both the PlayStation's YouTube and Twitch channels. Though it remains vague about what players can expect, Sony does promise to showcase games in development, quote, from top studios around the world, end quote, and offer a glimpse at several new creations from PlayStation Studios alongside third-party and indie partners, too. Sony does have several projects in the works as its PlayStation Studios, some of which include making a, some of which could make an appearance one highly impacted game in Marvel's Spider-Man 2, for example, which is expected to launch fairly so uh, fairly soon in the fall, despite so Sony showing very little of the game so far. Another PlayStation Studios headliner is Naughty Dog, which is working on a few new games, but teased its Last of Us multiplayer earlier this year. Uh, Sony does promise several new creations, however, meaning we could get some brand new game announcements in the showcase. All right, so the last uh, showcase uh, that they went full bore was in September of 21, in which at that time they revealed God of War Ragnarok and also announced Spider-Man 2 and Wolverine. And Aspire even showed up to announce Knights of the Old Republic remake. So, Alex, I'm going to go to you first. Um, I, I know that you can't... We're not doing really predictions, but what would you like to see Sony show that possibly we don't know about yet? Well, looking at, uh, you shared something on the Facebook page that has, you know, what we know of what everybody's working on. And some of those are, you know, educated <coughs> guesses, we can assume, right. but we're not for sure. But there's still a lot of question marks. So who knows? I mean, we kind of, the t Sony's two biggest known projects are both coming in from Insomniac, and that's Wolverine and Spider-Man. So, you know, we have, we can assume that Gorilla's working on Horizon 3, and they've got the unannounced multiplayer project. Ghost of is probably a safe bet from Sucker Punch. Insomnia or Naughty Dog. I mean, I'm just trying to think of studios we haven't heard from in a long time. I mean, Housemark is working on something, and we're probably, either this year or next year, due to hear what they're working on following Returnal. Um, Blue Point, we... Yeah, there's just so much up in the air that we don't know about. I mean, with with Twisted Metal, the series on Peacock coming out, and by the way, I watched that trailer that you guys talked about, and uh, Sweet Tooth looks good. It's the one where Sweet Tooth slams the door shut at the end. Most of it's Anthony Mackie in, in Roadkill, right? Right. Yeah. I'm. My comment is I want a darker version of, like, Twisted Metal because I think that with – well, Sweet Tooth, the, the glimpse of him we got was good. Anthony Mackie dancing around and stuff and being kind of, I don't know, in kind of a goofy spirit. Like, it just didn't fit the twisted metal. That's what we said. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not sure that I enjoy the the fact that Anthony, not, not, not that Anthony Mackie's a bad pick for an actor for the role. It's just the demeanor that he showed in the trailer is not what I would expect from a twisted metal driver. I mean, these people are, you know, 
they win the Twisted Metal tournament and then they get a wish from Calypso. And they're usually in very dire situations. They're either sick, someone they love is sick. You know, there's some major problem going on. So they're not, you know, dancing around, listen, listening to mixtapes or something like that. They're like they're like they're Star Lord, like they're Peter Quill. So I, I wasn't a big fan of that, but we'll see how the, the show turns out. I thought Sweet Tooth looked good. So, um, but yeah, I would like to see something, you know, some life revived into the Twisted Metal series after what happened, you know, with the the last one helmed by David Jaffe, the original creator of the series who couldn't even really, Bring it I don't back. know, maybe that's the best sign that Twisted Metal is past its heyday where the guy who created it, you know, comes back onto the project and, and he can't even, you know, put out a great Twisted Metal game. But All right. yeah, I, Yield? I just don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm. No, I'm, I don't know really what else to say. I mean, we're probably going to hear more about Spider-Man, but Twisted Metal is, you know, we're not going to, I doubt we're going to hear anything about Sly Cooper. Sly Cooper and Twisted Metal are the, the kind of two Sony properties hanging in the balance now that we really have no idea. I mean, we can assume Jack and Daxter is never coming back, but Sly and, and Twisted Metal seem like they could come back, that they're kind of in this purgatory we just don't know yet. All right, Yield? Uh, I have no clue. I what I'm looking forward to this is I want uh, new games that I haven't heard of. Uh, sprinkle in some things the of uh, games that like we know about. You know, show us a, show us a little bit more of Wolverine. Show us a little bit about Spider Man. Uh, but I want new announcements. Hopefully, I'm going to say a fifty fifty of single player experiences and multiplayer experiences don't flood me with multiplayer experiences dear god i will complain to high heaven uh and um i know they're they're gonna throw out some vr2 stuff which is fine um make it good for you guys that like your guy guys you gamers that like vr and yeah, that that's what I'm looking forward to. Is just I'm, I'm looking forward to stuff that m- makes me I want to play that game. Oh, and I want to see something on Knights of the Old Republic. All right, so I'm sending you guys a picture now that I purposely held back for the uh, until this part of the show. Um, I'm sending it in the Skype chat so you guys can look. Uh, somebody leaked a picture of potential uh, games that are going to be announced on the showcase. This is all a rumor. Take this with a grain of salt. Um, but some of the names of the games, uh, The Last of Us Fashions by Naughty Dog, Twisted Metal by Fire Sprite, Pragmata by Capcom, Resident Evil 4 VR by Capcom, Snake Eater Subsequent uh, by uh, oh, K- Konami. I would be super stoked for the third one up from the bottom. Hold on. Let me, let me get to it. Uh, Silent Hill 2 uh, <laughs> by Konami. Mortal Kombat. We're probably going to see that. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth by Square Enix. Disney Domination by Square Enix. Astro's Conquest by Team Asobi. I'd like to see that one. Um, that's a that, VR2 exclusive. That's gonna be, yeah, but that's going to be a VR2 exclusive. Uh, Half-Life Alex, uh, VR2 exclusive. Uh, Death Stranding 2 by Ko- Kojima. Stellar Blade by Shift Up. Hades 2 by Supergiant. Darkest Dungeon by Red Hook Studios. Goodbye Volcano High. Uh, by KOOP, the Dishwasher Collection uh, by SKA Studio. I don't know what the hell that is. Ghost of a Tale. Uh, you might. You know, if if I hadn't already looked on the internet and heard that it was mentioned that they're already working on it, I'd be super stoked for that. But I already, I mean, I'll be stoked to see it if they actually showed something. But I already knew they were working on something. Uh, Last Soul Aside by Ultra Ult. Ulti Zero Games, Killzone by Firewalk, take it away from Gorilla, uh, Ghost of Kamakura by Sucker Punch, I guess that would be Ghost of Shishima 2. That uh, would be my guess. I'm going to skip the one now that you'll just said he's really stupid for, do that one last, uh, because we have Marvel Spider-Man 2 by Insomniac, and Dark Side by Santa Monica Studio. Um, obviously, they, they we knew that they were moving away from God of War, and the game that uh, Yield is super stoked if it gets announced. Hell Divers 2 by Arrowhead Game Studios. Uh, Matt G says, rumor is KOTOR may be fully dead. So, uh, Yield, I'll let you go first. 
any of these games, obviously, Helldivers 2, but any of, the, uh, of these games uh, got you excited? Uh, Helldivers 2, Ghost of a Tale 2, and that would be it. Everything else... I mean, like, like I said, I don't really care about The Last of Us Faction. Twisted Metal, I mean, you're, you're going to have to sell me on the trailer because I've never, I'm, you know, never played the series. So I don't know. And I don't care about Resident Evil. don't care about Snake Eater. Da, 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 da. Yeah, pretty much mo- pretty much 95% of this, you're going to either, either I'm not that jazzed about most of it, you're going to have to try to sell me on your trailer. I'm, I'm Googling but, what the hell but, dishwasher but, collection is. But that happens. Alex? So I know it's an hour-long showcase, but that seems like a lot of big games to talk about. I mean, these are, you know, we're probably just going to get a short, like some of them may be part of a montage, so we're not going to just get, like, in-depth on all of these. I assume Spider-Man if this is true, would close the show. But some of these are probably just going to be teasers, just announcements, part of sizzle reels or something like that. But it's a lot to go through in an hour. But, I mean, if that if they could come out with that, I mean, that would be a killer show. I think that would make a lot of people happy because I think some at least everybody could find something to, to be excited for. I'm trying to figure out what the hell the dishwasher collection is. I've heard of it, but I couldn't describe it to you. It's, yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, obviously, I'm stoked about, uh, you know, factions. I, I want to see uh, Sneak Eater. Uh, it's supposedly supposed to be the Metal Gear 3 remake. Uh, Astro's Conquest, you know, it might actually make me buy a VR2. I like those Astro games. Death Stranding 2, uh, I don't know if I can go through another Death Stranding game. That was a, that, that was a, a labor of love there. Uh Obviously, if Ghost of Kamakura is the uh, Ghost of Tsushima 2, obviously that. Spider-Man 2, obviously. Uh, never get into Helldivers like you guys did. Um, I don't know if, Alex, I don't know if you have it in you to go through another Helldivers game. It wasn't the game itself. It was just the trophy, the one last lingering trophy that you had to do 100,000 kills, and it just took forever. You know, you had, you had already beaten a campaign, and it's like, well, you know, i got to keep playing. Some of us were lucky enough to do that. Oh, you, ne- you never got that platinum? Oh, no, I got the platinum, but I had my 100,000 kill long before I was, was able to beat a campaign because every every campaign I play in at some... Of course, now, you know, I'm playing many years after Alex did. Right. It, you know, it relies on everybody. So it relies on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, everybody. And... It always did. It always failed that the monkeys would fail, and we'd lose the war, and we'd lose the war. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 I like, still remember you saying that. <laughs> and I'm just like, damn it. So yeah, I had my hundred thousand kill long before I won a galactic war. All right, all right. So, uh, not to plug their show, but if you. There is a prediction contest going on in the Loop Brothers that I just uh, recorded with them. So I don't know when their show is coming out. I think it's tomorrow as of us recording this. Monday, if you listen to this on Wednesday. Uh, so there's penalties involved. Hopefully I don't lose. Did you bet any money on it? No, it was a, it was a pride bet where uh, the, the person that wins um, has to... Uh, it's usually the person that loses has a penalty, whether it be play a bad game or you have to go on to their show and basically like constantly praise them. You know, like if I won and Daryl lost, he would have to come on the show and say, you know, stuff like Tricky's the best gamer ever. I'm so in awe of his trophy count. I wish I could be a gamer like him. Stuff like that. Just gotcha. It's like a, a, a whole show of humiliation, which I really don't want to have to say that kind of stuff to Daryl. All right. Well, we know you mean it. We know that's what you actually think. It's just you don't like to say it out loud. I'm sure that when you send him, you know, Valentine's Day cards, that he, uh, that that's what's written in the middle. It's like, hey, you know what? I really think you're a great trophy hunter, Daryl. That's all. That's not true at Love all. Love Tricky Mick. Not true at all. Um, now I'm just going back up because I got to hit a button. Time to check my 
social media, yeah. All right, so we have one question, and it is undoubtedly uh, slanted at me because I already know Alice's yields answers. Matt G wants to know, if bad games detract from your service, can't the same be said for bad spam trophies? It devalues the whole system. Uh, Alex, I will let you go first. Yeah, I mean, Sony doesn't really seem to have an interest in reining this in. I mean, we read an article what some time back where they were gonna, you know, kind of push these type of games like further away from like the front page of the PSN store. But it's trophy one of those things where they matter. They, they matter to you. It's like I know Sony wants to make them some big important thing, but in the reality, for most people, it's like I want to get who who are trophy hunters. They are like, I want to get as many as possible, and I'll get them however I can. It's just like the trophies are important to you and really no one else. So it's kind of just based on who you are as a gamer. Or do you take pride in the games you play, or do you just want to accumulate just mass numbers? It's like, are you an Alex or a Tricky? You know, do you want just sheer bulk and what you know to drive up the numbers like Tricky, or do you want me with my completion percentage being almost ninety percent? And that's what I take pride in. So. I, I mean, Sony could do more to be like, you know what? We're going to get rid of these spam games. But again, they're probably making some money off each one of these spam games. And they are, again, feeding that bloodlust that people have, the trophy hunters have for platinum trophies. So in doing so, they're probably, you know, making it seem a little, their, their system seem a bit farcical by having all these easy, you know, 20 second platinums out there. But again, they're, they have a fan base of people who want to get to accumulate trophies faster than they can breathe. So. They're just feeding into that, feeding the craze. Yield? Well, ultimately, it depends on what kind of gamer you are. If you are, by definition, a trophy whore, then, you know, spam away. I mean, and and there are people who are like that. Uh, You know, if you're, you know, Alex is more of a completionist. I am borderline a completionist, but I want to get platinums in the games that I that are achievable and, and I play the games that I want to play, you know, the story's interesting. The gameplay looked cool. Something along that line. Someone talked me into playing a co-op game, you know, something like that, that the platinum's achievable, then I'm, I'm going to go for it. But I, you know, as much as we pick on tricky and even, you know, Daryl for their, and, you know, spamming ways, even kind of Sid, we were picking on him, you know, spamming away. CJ if, as well. CJ as well. If if that's how you want to game, game. You know, I'm I'm not going to sit here and and belittle you or berate you because you've got a platinum count of 3,000, you know. Hey, awesome. Way to go, you know. I, you know, from my standpoint, I've got, well, I'm at 172, and I'm proud of every single one of them. All right. Uh, before I give my answer, Daryl replied. He says, this is very true. I struggle with this personally. Why try for a long, hard plat when you can get the easiest, cheap plat, and they weigh the same? That is true. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to you know boost up anything right now, but... My plat in the Jumpin' Taco is worth the same amount as my plat in Horizon Forbidden West. Does it devalue... Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. go ahead. Finish finish your statement. I was going to say, does it devalue it? I mean, kind of. But, I mean, as Alex said, like, if that's what you want to play, play it. You know, it doesn't matter... In the long scheme of things, because trophies only matter to us. And it don't, like, I could brag about having a trophy count, or a plaque count of 727. But if Yield doesn't care about that, you know, his plaque count. 600 of your games. Right. Then what does it matter? Like, yeah, I, for a long time, I went on a trophy platinum binge because I was getting, uh... PlayStation Sony rewards like there was a, they had a thing where if you gotten uh, 10 platinums they gave you like a $10 PSN card so it was you know worth it to me but in the grand scheme of things like does the trophy count really matter no 
It doesn't. But I like being able to come on here and say, I got 600 more plats and you yield. But if yield turns around and goes, I don't give a shit, then what does it really matter? Go ahead, uh, yield, because uh, we have a comment from Matt G in the chat, but I'll let you go first because I cut you off. I, I was going to say you were talking about, you know, a, a, a 15 minute plat compared to a 30 hour plat. And it brought me to, I was playing uh, Farm Simulator 19 today, and I forget how many hours it said I've logged into it already. And I'm just like, I'm just like, wow, you know, there are ways where you could get it far, far quicker. The platinum, that is. And I'm just kind of like, yeah. You're having fun with the game. Why do you want to rush it? As much as I would like to just check this box off and be like, okay, I'm done with it. On to my next chill game, so to speak. I'm just like, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm enjoying myself. I'm just moseying along. There's no reason to, to burn through it, so to speak. But I just find it kind of funny. Because I feel the same way. Because, like, I, I've long, 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 long gotten the Divi- uh, Division 2 Platinum. But I still play the game. I wish they would add more trophies to it, but I I, I know this is going to be very hypocritical what I say. is like, I don't necessarily play a game to get a platinum. I never really have. But I'm also the gamer that will buy the Jumpin' Taco to sit there and hold a button for 12 seconds and get a platinum. But, with like, somebody asked me if I'm going for the Jedi Survivor Platinum. I got no desire to go for it right now. Well, you still don't have the Fallen Order Platinum, do you? Mm, I think I got that one. Did you? I think I got that one, didn't I? I could be wrong. You walked away from it, so unless you went back and got it, I don't think Um, you did. did. I'm going to go look right now while you're talking. 100%, 100%, I I don't know if I went back and got it or not. I got to ask then, if you're you're not just like saying, I'm going to get a Platinum, why play the spam games? Because while you while you say some of them are enjoyable, most of them are not. Well, no, so, hold on, hold on. So, See, and th- this is where I think we need to clarify spam games. Okay, you guys, I'm saying you would you and yield, you would classify a Radalika game as a spam game. To me, that's not a spam game because it is a legit game that you can get a platinum in quickly, but there are. Good quality uh, Radalika Platinums. The Devious Dungeons, Square Boy, um, uh, uh, Dagger Hood. Um, those are all good, legit games. Yes, you can get a Platinum in them quickly because they don't require you to beat the whole entire game, but there's a lot... Of, some of those games, it's like, just go through. It's just... A spam game to me is something like the Jump and Taco where I just literally sit there and just hold down R1 for 12 seconds and I get a Platinum. That's a spam game to me. Or what we classified as a rat plat, I think the definition has changed since we started using that term because the rat Alika games are not spam games to me. I get the jumping tacos and stuff like that. One because it's goofy, you know. Two, you know that that's what it is. And yeah, I stacked up like five hundred of them over the last year where I wasn't allowed to play one uh, spam game. Just so on January 1st, I can go, hey, I got 200 Platinums in one day. But do I sit here and go, oh, I got a bigger E penis because on Alice because I have 600 you more Platinums? You absolutely do. You absolutely do. But I do that in joking. Do I sit here and go, I'm a better gamer than Alice because I have 600 more Plats? Like in my day-to-day? No. I don't do that at all. Like there's some Platinums that you have that I'm jealous of. That you you had the patience to go back and do. Like, I know that when you start playing Jedi Survivor, you're going to play it from start to finish, and you're going to play it probably before you move on. I just don't have the patience to go back and get all those collectibles. Like, Tross sent me a text today while we were boosting to tell me he got the Jedi Survivor play. Like, I'm proud of him. And in some way, I'm kind of jealous of him because I just don't have that desire. I'd much rather play Jedi Survivor, get the story out of it, and then go back to playing the Division or Grid Legends or whatever the case may be. Will will there be a day when I go, but you know what? Let me go finally knock out this Fiverr Platinum. Probably. But do I, as I'm sitting here right now, do I have any desire to go get that Platinum? No. I, I, think it's, I think it's funny, and I think it's, you know, more comedic, comedic to sit here and go, 
Oh, I got ten platinums the other day, and they were all jumping tacos. Yield. What was your research uh, dictate? Do I have the fallen order platinum? I'm I'm still looking. I was trying to compare over my phone, and it would not let me compare. So Matt G says, but the point is uh, of a, the it, but isn't the point of a high plat count to brag about it, show off to your question? Yes, but again. It, it comes down to who really cares about it. Like, I can brag about that I have 700 plats to you, Matt, but do you really give a shit? We know the answer to that. He <laughs> does not. Right. So, like, it... it, it if, see, and there's different uh, different levels of gamers, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. I'm just saying, like, if I sit here and go, I got 700 platinums to... I, I don't know. Kalai. Kalai's not going to care. But if I turn around to Daryl and say, I got 700 plats, he's like, oh, cool, dude. Because he cares about trophies. He, it, 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 all, it, all, it all matters who I'm bragging to, so to speak. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Okay. It makes perfect sense. By the way, I got 600 plats for both of you. I don't give a shit. I know. And I, I don't care about 575 of those platinum trophies. Oh, you, you, you gave me an extra 25 that Neil did. Neil says he doesn't care about 600 of them. Well, there's some good ones in there. I mean, you did get the platinum in both Horizons so, and Ghost of Shishima twice. So. Twice? After he said Ghost of Shishima sucked. I never said it sucked. I said I couldn't get into it. You know what? Just go to PSN profiles, Yield. That, that, that's what I'm doing. And I'm back to 2019, and I don't see it yet. You could you could do a search for it. You can search for it? Yeah. Just type at the top. All in order. Uh, and survey says, if it goes through, it's not going through. See, this is what I. This is one of the things that one aspect of the spam games I don't like is that you play so many games and you get so many platinums that it's hard to find any of the games you've played. You know? No, you have not. I You're do, at I do forty-seven percent on tw- the five. I have 21, three, 21 of forty three, trophies. Yeah, thirty-three percent on the four. Yeah. All right. Why did I stop getting that? Pl- oh, because the big ass spiders. I had to fight that big ass spider for a legendary. That's why I stopped playing it. <sighs> okay. Uh, uh, Alex, we cut you off. I'm sorry. I don't think you cut me off at all. Oh, then I didn't hear what you said. I apologize. Yeah. Well, open your ears and shut your mouth. Wow. Okay. Well, then I'm not. Hosting. I, no, I. I'm I not mean, hosting it anymore. Then fuck you. Then I guess the episode's done, and you get to edit a half done episode. How long have we been going? Hour and a half. All right. Well, we got we got some time. All right. Let's go into our topic of the week. Uh, actually, before we go into our topic of the week, let's throw it across the pond to for Gareth for this week's uh, trophy variety update. And we're back. Thank you very much, Gareth, for that. All right. Topic of the week. Uh, PlayStation CEO is sticking to its current strategy for the PlayStation 5 exclusives. This is coming from Christina Alexander over at IGN. Sony is taking PlayStation 5 exclusivity for its first party titles very seriously. PlayStation CEO Jimmy Ryan. Uh, I, no, Daryl, I hate you. Jim Ryan says the company is sticking he to it. He calls him franchise Jimmy Ryan. Get it right. I know. Is sticking to its gun to its current strategy of not launching PC versions of the game on day one. In a recent interview with Famitsu, Ryan dismissed the idea of releasing PC versions of PlayStation 5 exclusive games, such as God of War Ragnarok, on the same day they launch on the PS5 proper, saying that porting them to PC two to three years after the fact has been working out well for Sony. Quote, We fully understand the importance of the PlayStation 5 exclusive titles. As I mentioned earlier, PlayStation Studios' main responsibility is to make games for the latest PlayStation hardware that players will enjoy. 
We're increasing the number of PlayStation 5 exclusive games and staggering the release of the PC versions, end quote. He added, quote, I often have the opportunity to ask game fans for their opinions, and when I ask them how they feel about the time lag, they often say they feel the release of a PC version two to three years after the release of the PlayStation version is acceptable, end quote. Sony's ported Horizon Zero Dawn to PC in 2020, three years after it released on the PS4, making it the first PlayStation to make the crossover to the platform. The company previously, the, the company was previously against PC releases, preferring to stick to only consoles. In 2021, Ryan said Sony planned to port more of its games to PC, starting with Days Gone, because its quote ease of making them available to non-console players has grown. End quote. Xbox head Phil Spencer has criticized PlayStation, PlayStation for its staggering PC release schedule, pointing out that consumers are forced to pay an exorbitant amount for the PS5 or PS4 in order to play the games designed exclusive for those consoles, then pay up for the PC versions years later. Meanwhile, Xbox is the only platform that releases its games on console, PC, and cloud simultaneously, especially on Game Pass. However, porting first-party titles to PC is not without its challenges. When The Last of Us Part 1 released on PC via Steam back in March, it had performance issues and crashes that were so severe that for many players, Naughty Dog apologized to them and promised to patch it with an update. All right, so there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm going to start the conversation off, gentlemen. Uh, I think what PlayStation is doing is absolutely correct, and I think Phil Spencer is out of his fucking mind um lately uh going back to the article he says that playstation is uh forced to pay an exorbitant amount for the ps4 or ps5 in order to play the games designed exclusive for the consoles then pay up for pc versions later if i played it on the four why am i paying for it for the pc later your only argument would be oh pc players gotta wait to play the game okay how many times have we dealt with console exclusives or, you know, it's releasing here first and you have to wait a year for exclusivity because it's going to Xbox. We did that with what? Uh, Tomb Shadow Raider? Of the, uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah. This is, this is the way the industry works. And, and Phil Spencer turned around saying, oh, you have to pay an exorbitant amount of money for a PS5 and then buy it on PC later. Well, I got news for you, Phil Spencer. You're paying an uh, even higher price for the PC. Just putting it out there. Yield, I'll let you go first because I'm going to lose my mind. Um, I'm okay with the fact that they release it later. They PS5 exclusives do not need to be released on the PC day and date um, because they're PlayStation exclusives. That's the kind of the whole point of it. Um, we, we've said it before, you know, um, you know, with Xbox, you know, they need their own exclusives their own exclusive games so that way you know if you have several games that are desirable you will buy their system to play it instead of having to wait a year or two so i'm perfectly fine with sony's strategy alex i thought when we were talking about an interview with herman holst he was saying a year in between releases on the PC. I mean, I, I know they're getting the back catalog up now, like Spider-Man and Horizon Zero Dawn, and making sure that those are on the service now. But I think going forward, they're going to run out of back catalog games to put on this on PC, and, and they're going to have to, you know, kind of scrunch that in from two to three years down to one. Because obviously you're, you know... After a certain amount of time, people may pass by a game. People on PC, there's lots to play. They may be like, well, it's been three years. I haven't played this game in three years. I don't really care anymore. So they might want to scrunch it down to one year just so that it's still relatively fresh as, as far as a game release. And it doesn't kind of fall inside like the path, like the, the moving wildebeest through like the Lion King Valley where it's like just a rush of everything. And if you miss it, you know, if you haven't played it in a certain amount of time, you just generally kind of pass it by without even thinking about it. Um. As far as like not releasing day and date, well, it doesn't it doesn't make sense for them to release a day and date on PC. To be honest with you, uh, their their strategy is as far as like having an exclusive to the PlayStation for a while and moving on to PC makes perfect sense. The problem for Xbox is, I mean, it's two different strategies. But Xbox, the problem for them is that they have made it completely 
unneeded to own an Xbox. You don't need to own an Xbox. I mean, aside from the the fact that you know, if if you don't want to deal with the PC, or the the cost of you know upgrading a PC, then an Xbox makes more sense just for something to plug in and play at home, you know, for ease of use. But for the most part, PC is the better place to play Game Pass than game than Xbox. So. And Xbox has had a lot of trouble churning out first-party exclusives that are worth a damn recently. So, you know, Sony Sony is still very much focused on selling you a box that you have in your room and you play games on. Microsoft is not so much anymore. So it's two different strategies, so I don't necessarily agree. While I've, I will give Spencer, Phil Spencer a lot of credit for things he's come out and said recently, I don't necessarily agree that Sony is in any way doing anything wrong here. Just because that's Microsoft's strategy doesn't necessarily mean it has to be Sony's, and I will repeat that. When it comes to revenue, Sony gener- generates more revenue in its gaming arm than Microsoft does. So, you know, until we see a shift in that, Sony's doing just fine. Um, i trying to think of anything else. But, but yeah, I mean, timed releases, bring them to PC, you know, maybe a year later. I think three years is too late, you know. But I, I think that making sure it's an exclusive on the, P- on the PlayStation first so that people want to own your console is a smart thing for Sony to do because, you know, they're not quite moving away from the box as fast as, say, Phil Spencer and Microsoft are. See, and, you know, I, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse with this, but the fact that, like Alex pointed out, like, there's no reason for you to buy an Xbox right now because if you have a PC, then you're going to buy it on PC. If you don't own a PC... Then you're going to buy it on Xbox. So his whole his old thing is, it, it, oh, you're making people pay more money. That's what happens. If I want the game on PlayStation 5, then I buy it on PlayStation 5. If I want it on my PC, I want it on my PC. I, right now, I'm honestly contemplating whether to buy the Division 2 on the PC. Not for any other reason than, hell, I love the game, and two... The, the PTS servers, uh, when they come out for the, the, the new updates, they only put the PTS servers on PTS being public test server. Um, they only put that on the PC. So right now, the, people have gotten to play the new update that's not due out until June already. And it'd be great for me to sit here and be able to say, okay, yeah, this is good, this is bad, give my feedback for the game that I absolutely love. But if I want it, then I'm going to go buy it on PC. The only reason I haven't is because I'm not a keyboard and mouse guy and I can't get a, a DualShock or a DualSense to work on my PC. That's the only reason I haven't bought one yet. But it... it, it I, I, I don't understand Phil Spencer's line of thinking because Sony to me, and I'm not being a Sony pony here, Sony to me is working and saying, listen, PlayStation is where... Uh, okay, hold on. Matt G says, what the fuck do you mean, Tricky? Dual Sense works on PC? I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm telling you, I haven't got it to work. Um, Going back to my point, what was I ma- What was I saying? I don't know. PlayStation is the place, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so Sony is saying PlayStation is the place to work, and that's where they're going. I think Phil Spencer and... His team decided, well, we're not going to win on the console race, so let's start releasing our games on the on the PC, because as we we've said many times, console manufacturers lose money selling their consoles; they make their money back on the software. I think Phil Spencer turned around and said, "Well, listen, why don't we just make sure our game is available there, and we'll make back that money." And in some aspects, that's true, but then you double down by saying, "Oh." All our first party games, the games that we spend tens of million dollars invest uh, uh, developing, we're going to give it to you for free for $60 a year. And in some cases, people paid $12 because they bought they paid a dollar a month or they got 3 months for a dollar or 6 months for a dollar. I'm one of them. I have Game Pass. And you know how much I paid for it? Total in my lifetime, $4 and I've had it for 3 years. And I've not played one game on there. Not one. Best $4 ever spent. I could go play Gears of War right now. I could go play Halo. I could play Redfall if it actually worked. Sony Pony. You're being a Sony Pony. <laughs> You're dick yield. Uh, but 
listen, Phil Spencer's making a bad, a lot of bad choices, and he's trying to criticize other people, and that just doesn't sit well with me. You made well, look at this. Well, okay, sorry. I I thought you were done there. I, I I will finish after this. You made Phil Spencer. You made bad business decisions that probably looked good when you were making them because you were all about the gamer. But the bottom line is you have a responsibility to Microsoft, you have a responsibility to the Xbox team, and you have a responsibility to the stockholders, and it's failing horribly. And instead of owning up and saying you fucked up, you're trying to blame other people. Oh, Sony's trying to make you pay twice for the same game. Get off your bullshit, Phil. And I hope he hears this. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours. I hope he hears this too because that means our podcast is much bigger than I think it is. But... What we've also learned about streaming services, especially when it comes to watching on your TV, is that a lot of companies lose money on streaming services. You know, um, Paramount, Peacock, some of these places. And I mean, why do you think they keep raising prices on stuff? So we're starting to find out more and more that streaming services aren't a great business for the people who run the businesses. Because you think about how much money you charge people every month for their subscription but then also how much you're paying for licensing fees to get movies and television shows onto your service and how much you're investing in your own original products like Netflix. So I assume that at some point we're going to learn the same thing about, you know, the game subscription services where it may not be super feasible to run these things because the people who run them are probably losing a lot of money on them. Yield your and how and how and as soon as they raise the price for Game Pass because they will, because they've already got people like I don't say addicted to it, but they've already got people in. They already have shown people what a great value it is for the gamer. At some point, they're going to have to raise the prices, and that's not you know a bad. Th- they're not evil for that. They just have to at some point. But if it goes up to twenty dollars a month or twenty five thirty, how long before see people start complaining? How long before they start pissing people off? Well, it's it's fifteen dollars a month right now. I think for Game Pass Ultimate. Which includes Xbox and PC, I think. Uh, but why I looked that up, Yield? Do you have any final thoughts? None that I can think of. All right. Uh, let's see. Game Pass Ultimate right now. Hold on. I'm Googling it. Of course, it doesn't tell me a price. It just says join now. Uh... All right, let's see. Join now. Let's see. Ultimate, which is $15 a month. Um, play hundreds of games on your high-quality console, PC, and cloud. Uh, new games all the time. Xbox Game Studios, same day's release. Blah, 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 blah. Includes Riot Games benefits. Okay. Uh, PC is $10 a month, and console is $10 a month. So for $10 a month, you get it either on the PC or the console. For $15 a month, you get it both. And you also get uh, EA Play with the PC, and uh, you get an Xbox Live Gold uh, 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 membership. So, Xbox Gold is what ten dollars a month. So, you're getting console, which is ten dollars, PC, which is ten dollars, and you're getting uh, Xbox Gold, which is ten dollars. That's thirty dollars. But you're only charging fifteen dollars for ultimate, and you're getting uh, EA Play included with it. The, you're losing a lot of money, and then you want to blame other people. I I don't know. I I'm not going to sit here and say that they're losing a bunch of money on this, but given the fact that we've had numbers for television streaming services that are not doing so well you're going to have to assume that some of that's going to bleed over into the games industry. Now, whether that's Game Pass or not, I don't know. But it's becoming more and more obvious that these streaming services in the beginning were a much better deal for the consumer than they were for the people who own them. I mean, uh, WB Network, I think, when it first launched... Was nine ninety nine. You know, what's that? It was nine ninety nine? Yeah, but weren't they losing money on it? Well, it's because they didn't have all the content they had on it. Yeah, but that, that's what I'm saying. As we go on more and more, and as they have to raise the prices on these streaming services, again, they're having to pay so much to host all this content and to host all these servers, and yet oh, we're, we're only paying so much for all this content. I mean, it just it's a better deal for the consumer than it is for the people who own the company. Yes. And I assume that that is, like I said, 
going to mirror itself in the realm of, you know, video games. I mean, in, in Spotify, Spotify is such a better deal for the customer because when you think about the music musicians and, you know, they may make a lot of money on merchandising and touring, but when it comes to like selling music, something like Spotify is such a great deal for the consumer because you're only paying so much a month to listen to pretty much any music you want to listen to. So streaming services have come about because we love convenience and they're very consumer friendly, but are they as friendly for the companies who run them? And in some cases, definitely not. I just texted Tross because he came back into the Twitch chat. I said, did you hear my rant? He goes, about Phil Spencer? Yeah, it was great. I agree with you. Spencer is full of shit. Like I, like, I like what Yield said last week. Quote, if you make good games, they will come. End quote. Phil Spencer doesn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to wrap up the show. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't want to keep going on. Yield your shout out, sir. Uh, shout out to JT Nitro, Tricky, Homer Gets Dust for the Assassin's Creed 4 boosting this weekend. Uh, shout out to Tricky and Alex for recording tonight. Shout out to uh, Nitro again for some Deep Rock Galactic. And uh, shout out to everybody hanging out in the Twitch chat. Glad you all decided to uh, pop in on a Sunday night and listen to us ramble on about the industry. And uh, shout out to all the pimps and the mountains of the Hordom for hanging out with us in the Facebook group, putting on awesome side contests and all that to keep the community engaged. That's it. Peace out. Alex, your shout outs. Give a shout out to our awesome community, the listeners, the fuel to the fire of this trip yours, without whom this show would not still exist. Thank you all for continuing to push us forward with your amazing support. Give a shout out to Tricky and to Yield for recording tonight. And last but not least, a shout out to my loving and awesome girlfriend, Ashley. I love you, honey. Let's catch up on Succession and Yellow Jacket soon. Maybe tonight after the show. If we get done soon enough, which we're almost done. Uh, I want to give a shout out to you boys, obviously. Shout out to Matt G, uh, Tross, and... Darth Knight, I saw you in the chat too, although you didn't say anything. Um, appreciate you guys. Appreciate everybody that listens to the show. Go check out the Patreon episode between Alex and Matt G on uh, Burden and Shores. That's out now. You can listen to it for only a dollar over our Patreon. That's patreon.com backslash Proving Gamer. Thank you very much. Shout out to the goddess. Shout out to Sweet Mama D. And shout out to all the listeners. If there's nothing else, until next week, happy trophy hunting. See ya. Later. The theme song is Venus by the band Even off their album Zenith. Permission granted by the band and 12 Stone Records. You can find them on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash evenphilippines.